Our next speaker is Mr. Rick Howard, the Chief Security Officer for Palo Alto Networks. With prior experience at the highest levels of technical leadership for several global companies, Mr. Howard is a trailblazer within the cybersecurity community. Retiring from the U.S. Army after 23 years of service, Mr. Howard held various leadership positions involving computer security, culminating with that of Chief of the U.S. Army's Computer Emergency Response Team. He holds an MS and a BS from the Naval Postgraduate School and the United States Military Academy, respectively. Please help me welcome Mr. Rick Howard. So hello, everyone. Let me get to the controversial stuff right away. Uh, Sean, are you still in the room? You're not, uh, you don't have a Silicon Valley hoodie complete unless you have blue jean Silicon Valley, all right? <laughs> All right, and Greg, I just want you to know you said something really controversial at the front about how, uh, what a bad idea it was to have dinosaurs, okay, with Jurassic Park. First, that's not a bad idea because, you know, dinosaurs, right? Come on, dinosaurs. You're going to get dinosaurs, all right? All right, okay, we'll, we'll let you fly with velociraptors. So I'm going to here talk about the uh, Cybersecurity Cannon Project, all right, but first we're going to talk about, let's see how fast this goes. How technical are you? I know you guys think you're a technical crowd, all right? So I'm going to give you a test. Just make sure that you are as technical as you think. I got this from Bruno Oliveria off the internet, so you know it's true. All right? So this is a, how do geeks versus non-geeks handle a flaky internet connection at your house? All right? So there's two kinds of people. Okay, we're going to worry about them on the, on the y-axis is how much hope do you have that you're going to solve the problem. And on the x-axis is how much time goes by before you do solve the problem. All right, and on the red line, these are the non-geeks. These are the beautiful people. Look around the room. <laughs> these are not you people, okay? <laughs> so they have a shaky internet connection, and they let it go for a while, but even they start to lose hope a little bit, and they start to uh, uh, falter a little bit, and finally they have a great idea. They're going to call the ISP, and that's going to solve their problem. So their hope goes back up on the chart, right? That's what non-geeks will do. For the geeks... These are my peeps. You know who you are in here. You are the blue line. Now, you're going to fix the problem because you are a cybersecurity geek. You're going to reload the website a couple of times. You're going to try another site. You're going to check the network settings. You're going to turn the router off and on. You're going to reset the router, and, you know, that's going to fix it. And so your hope goes back up. But when it doesn't fix it, now you're going to break out the real network commands and try everything. But that doesn't fix it either, so you have to resort to calling the ISP. And so your hope goes down, and you're in the pit of despair. So a show of hands, how many people are the beautiful people? You can claim it, the one guy in the back room. <laughs> awesome, okay. Uh, the rest of you, hands up, geeks in the room? Fantastic, all right. So by the fear, uncertainty, and doubt committee of the state of California, I now declare you technical enough to hear this, uh, the rest of this presentation. All right, so we're going to talk about this project that I came up with a couple of years ago. And, uh, and it started out because I'm a big reader of cybersecurity books, like a lot of you are. And I have a bunch of them in my basement in a nice shell. And I was down there feeling superior because I had read all these cybersecurity books, and I know most of you had not yet. So I'm saying I must be better than everybody. And I, then I pulled one of those books off the shelf and realized I couldn't remember a darn thing that was in the book. Okay? Not one thing could I remember in the book. So uh, that was a little embarrassing. Okay, just a little. So I decided that I would start rereading some of them that I thought were worthy, and I would start to take notes just so I could remember what was in those books in, you know, just casual conversation. And then I started writing book reviews for a company I was working with uh, at iDefense, and that turned into uh, my own personal blog site where I was publishing these reviews. So it kind of grew and grew, and I started to collect a bunch of book reviews on cybersecurity topics, and I got this idea that the cybersecurity community, all of us in this room, we should have a collection, a collection of books that deals with our history and our culture and what our best thinking is on various cybersecurity topics that we can all agree to are the things that we point all of our contemporaries to. So in that way, that's really what a canon is. So we started calling this the Cybersecurity Canon Project. All right? And so if you want to define what a canon is, I went looking on the, you know, the most uh, impressive sites on the internet, you know, dictionary.com. All right, and it says, here's what a canon is, a group generally accepted by a bunch of us representing our field. Okay, it's a list of writings that we recognize as genuine. 
right? And it's a list of works that we are considered permanently established, meaning that they don't fall out of favor because they're they kind of evergreen in that process. So by doing those three definitions, I said, here's what the canon is. All right, so I had this idea, and I presented it at the RSA conference in San Francisco last year, and it was very well received, so much so that my company decided to sponsor it. So what, we're gonna, what we are building now is kind of a rock and roll hall of fame for cybersecurity books, all right? We set it up along the same model, okay? We, well, we're gonna have a bunch of candidates on the list, and then every year we'll choose some of those books to be put into the canon. That was the original idea. All right, and so last year at our customer conference in Las Vegas, we inducted the first book into the cybersecurity canon off my original list. And it was uh, Parmy Olson's We Are Anonymous. How many people have read that book? Okay, holy cow. Homework for the rest of you, okay? Because you need to read this book, and I'll talk about that in a second. That's Parmy down there on the, on the right, right side that way, okay, receiving the award at the uh, ceremony in Las Vegas. All right, and so, after that, we decided we are going to make it formal, so we formed a committee. It wasn't going to be Rick Howard's cybersecurity canon, it was going to be the community's cybersecurity canon. So I went out and got a bunch of cybersecurity luminaries, okay, who would have some opinions about what books should be in the canon. Okay, really what that is is a bunch of my old friends who I could bend to my will. Okay, that's really what that was. Okay, and so you see a couple of folks up here, right? This guy, uh, Dr. Ragsdale, his son is sitting right there. He's going to present after me, okay? How cool is that? I, I changed his diapers, okay? <laughs> now he's a captain in the Army. I can't believe it. All right, and we also uh, got Parmy to be part of the committee, too, and she was very gracious with her time to help us get this off the ground. All right, so, and what the committee decided to do right away is to group the, my original candidate list into a bunch of different uh, buckets. So we got cyber warfare there, we have cyber history and culture, I'm gonna look back here, uh, cyber crime, we got technical books, we got cyber espionage, and yes, we have novels, okay? Because when I first started doing this, I thought most of the books were gonna be technical. That's when I, when I originally started doing it, that was what I thought was gonna happen. But what I realized, though, is that after usually mostly security books, they kind of fall out of date after a couple of years. I mean, my uh, Windows NT security guide, not going to be on the canon, okay? <laughs> so, and then also that, you know, I don't know about your family, but when I start to talk about cybersecurity at my house, all my daughters roll their eyes and say, Dad, please shut up, you're boring us, right? Because they really have no idea about what we do for a living. So I thought that if we could find novels uh, really good novels, that the cyber is correct, that maybe they should be in the canon too. Now, you know, the cyber in these books are not Harry Potter cyber. You know, you don't break into NSA by, gee, I guess the password by typing password, okay? It's not that kind of stuff. In these books, in this collection, there's some real cyber going on, and you can actually do some of those commands they talk about in the book, so we put those on the list. All right, so the arrows uh, indicate the new books we put on after we brought the uh, committee on. All right, uh, after, after the initial candidate list, got a couple of new cyber warfare books, uh, a couple of new culture books. Uh, Greenwald's book is absolutely on there, and I wanted to bring this up. It's one of those controversial things. I don't know what you think about Greenwald and Snowden, whether you think he's a hero or a traitor, but only people like us can have that conversation. Okay? When I talk to that stuff with my mother-in-law, she has no idea what I'm talking about. All right? So I encourage you to read the book, have the conversation, and let's get that into the open so we can all uh, understand it as a community. Uh, new crime book, Krebs books is excellent. Uh, a couple of new technical books that I'm going to talk about. So those are new entries into the candidate list this year. I'm going to talk about four of them because I just like them so much. So the first one is this one by Richard Baitlick. Anybody familiar with Richard Baitlick before? Yeah, he's excellent, right? <laughs> I, I found Richard, uh, he, he writes a lot of book reviews on cybersecurity topics uh, at Tau Security, his blog there. All right, but he and I also have common an ancestry. When I was at the Army CERT, he was at the Air Force CERT doing similar work. And since he got out, he's been doing cybersecurity operations at many big, big companies. And he is probably the leading thinker in our community about how to do network monitoring security, network monitoring. Really, this book, I'm saying in the commercial world, is the state of the art. Okay, it's theory and it's practice, okay? <laughs> and he talks about open source tools that you can use to go through to kind of try out what he's talking about in the book, so it's excellent. 
All right? And just by the way, we're talking about what are you looking for as a cyber person to hire? Okay? I have a go-to question that I use in interviews when I hire cybersecurity analysts. When I go through all the stuff I want them to be, the last question I ask them is, are you running Linux at your house? All right, if you're not running Linux at your house, you do not have the curiosity to be a cybersecurity analyst. You don't, you don't have what it takes to be part of my team. But I'm changing that interview question now. They need to be able to go through this book and go through all the examples, because if you don't have the wherewithal and the curiosity to make all that stuff work that's in Richard's book, then you probably can't be a high-end cybersecurity analyst. <laughs> now, what Richard talks about what the industry has done uh, over time, right? And what we have done, security vendors like us, we keep giving you one more box to put on the internet. We call it the cybersecurity conga line, right? That one more box is going to solve your problem, and Richard's absolutely against that, right? He also says that the defense in depth model that we've been using since I started in the 90s really doesn't work anymore, and we need to acknowledge that as a community and adopt the kill chain model that he talks about extensively in the book. His job, he wants us to know that our goal here is not to prevent the bad guys from getting into your network at all. Our job is to prevent the bad guy from accomplishing his goal, whether it's hacktivism or crime or espionage or whatever it is he came there to do. Our job is to stop them from doing that. Right? And so this is the best quote coming out of the book. Just assume that you're compromised okay? and do something about that. Change your model because you just know that you're already compromised. All right, so the open source tools in the book are fantastic. They came from the Security Onion rollout. So you get data collection tools like Argus, you get presentation tools like these, and you get uh, packet analysis tools like these, and he walks you through installing all those tools on your home network and running all those tools so you can see what you're doing. And as security professionals, you should be able to do these things with no problem. So I think this book represents the state of the art in the commercial world for how to do network monitoring, and I think you should have read it by now. So get your library cards out, go down and grit this book, or you know, I get a 10% cut from Amazon when you buy it from Kindle. Okay. All right, next book. Counting Down to Zero Day, written by uh, Kim Zetter from Wired Magazine. She's been a Wired journalist for 13 years. She's a fantastic writer and a fantastic journalist. And when I heard that she was writing uh, the definitive technical book about Stuxnet, I was very excited, okay, because I know that she's probably one or a handful of journalists that could get this right. Okay, and what you know is when we start to hear stories in the, in the open source about what's going on with the latest cyber attack, those stories come piecemeal. And it's tough for all of us in the community to understand the, the story in its entirety until someone writes a book about it, and that's what uh, Zetter did. Or she put the whole thing together. She's talking about uh, the Olympic Games operation that she ascribes to U.S. and Israeli uh, cyber operations. All right, and the first author that came that really published a book on this was David Sanger in his book, Confront and Conceal, published in like 2010. And he talks about really the first cyber war we've seen in the world. Okay, really where a nation state uh, destroyed critical infrastructure in another nation that we were not at war with. All right, so it's the first time we've seen that in the public. All right, so uh, Zetter goes differently, right? She doesn't talk about what... Uh, what uh, Sanger was talking about. She talks about the technical details of the attack, and she talks about the uh, open source researchers that put the whole story together. So it's a different angle on what Sanger was talking about. Right? And she really brings out a couple of things on SCADA and how vulnerable we are as a world, and particularly as the US, how vulnerable we are. All right? Because uh, these are the number of power plants, oil and gas stations, and public waterworks that have the same equipment that the Natanz power plant had in Iran. All right, these are the programmable logic controllers that were attacked uh, during the Olympic Games attack, and these are rampant throughout the world, and especially in the US. So she talks about that's a problem for us, that bad guys know about this, and that we are vulnerable to the same kinds of attacks. So and she brings up two philosophical conundrums all right, that, we sh that we all need to talk about as a community. And the first one is the intelligence dilemma. All right? This is something I've been dealing with my entire career. It is the difference between what the intelligence side of the house wants versus the network defenders want in the house. Right? The intelligence guys want to watch the adversary as he operates so we can learn what he's doing, learn where he's going, keep them on the net as much as possible. The network defenders want to kick him out as quickly as possible to reduce the pain. All right? 
So that is a dilemma that we've had, and that's a tension between the two groups that's been going on since the early 90s, right? And the second thing she talks about is the trying to get our head around the idea of being able to simultaneously create offensive capability and at the same time create defensive enterprises that protect against bad guys, all right? And how those things are kind of diametrically opposed, and we don't really have a solution for it, and the country itself doesn't really have its head around that problem. All right, so countdown to zero, if you want to get ahead on Stuxnet, it's a fascinating story. All the technical details are there. If you want to hear about all the zero days that were involved in that attack, it's fantastic journalism and library card. Should have read it by now, all right? Anybody ready yet? Okay, a couple of you. The rest of you guys get in line at the library, all right? All right, next one. We are anonymous by Parmi Olson, okay? It's really talking about uh, anonymous operations, anonymous, the hacker group anonymous from 2010 to 2011, and really they're franchising operations. Because if you know anything about hacktivism, this is not really a group that you join, okay? You don't pay dues to it. You just sort of assume the mantle of the name, okay? So franchising is really what it's about, right? And it's really the culmination of technology and uh, youthful disenfranchisement, we'll call that. Uh, pranks as an art form, okay? That's really what's coming to play here. All right, empowerment, these young folks have figured out they can actually get people to do stuff, right? And the hacking culture all combines together in this giant hairball of hacktivism activity that causes CEOs and political leaders to get worried during this time period. All right, and the big group out of this is uh, this group, LULSAC. They're the ones that did the damage, right? Uh, and the, uh, Parmi got un believable access to all those members in the group in order to write this book. So it's worth doing that just to hear what they had to say about what they were up to. It captures the essence and the drama and how franchise operations works inside the anonymous collective. All right, the, probably the biggest uh, public uh, hack that happened was really against Aaron Barr and against uh, H.B. Gary Federal. Everybody familiar with the story? Aaron's a friend of mine, so I feel like I can tell this story, right? Uh, he thought that he knew who members of the anonymous franchise were. And he told the world that he was going to announce that at some public cybersecurity conference. So he was trying to do information operations and do marketing at the same time. Okay? That doesn't work very well, all right? And what do you think the anonymous collective did when they found out that he was going to try to announce them? What do you think they did? They pounded him, all right? They took down his email server, his corporate web server. They took his Twitter account, his email accounts. They stole all the email from the uh, government, I mean, from the business email server and posted it on Pirate Bay for everybody to look up. They even provided an interface so you can look up your name to see if you were in any of the emails that he sent you. I had like 15 in there, okay? So, uh, and then uh, they pretty much, the, since then, okay, that company went out of business. Aaron Barr got fired and he's out of work. So that company is gone off the face of the earth, right? So the big leaders of this, I have to hold it. <laughs> ah, let's see. There we go. I'm catching up. All right. So the leader of Lulsec is this guy, Sabu, right? And he formed Lulsec after the Aaron Barr attacks and decided he was going to make a mark on the world. All right. And for 50 days after that, until about April 2011, 25 companies ravaged. They stole their data, they stole, uh, made, uh, defaced their websites, all kinds of things like that, all right? And then one day, the FBI shows up at his Brooklyn apartment and says, we give you two choices. You can either come work for us, or you can go to jail for a gazillion years. What do you want to do, okay? What do you think he did? He decides to turn, okay? He goes with the FBI, he disbands low-sec, starts anti-sec, another uh, hacker group, Okay, and then for another 50 days, this time sponsored by the FBI, okay, all right, doing the same kind of things, taking down email servers, hacking websites, 15 companies ransacked. This time all the data is stored on an FBI server furnished by the FBI. Very nice of them to do that, all right. And in the process, over 100 anonymous members were arrested over that time period. And when that happened, and at the end of this, the FBI announces who their snitch is. And the anonymous collective just goes, oh my goodness, not this guy. He was one of the leaders in the community, right? So for a while, about a year and a half after that, they kind of went silent as they regrouped about who they thought they could trust. 
All right, so if you want to know how hacktivism works, how the culture works, how the franchise operation works, it's an excellent book to take a look, and it's the first winner in the cybersecurity canon, and you should have read it by now. All right, Cuckoo's Egg. How many people have read Cuckoo's Egg? Oh, good. Okay, usually I talk, and most people have never heard this, because it's kind of an old book written in the late 80s. What's that? Because all of us are old, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> you're right, that's exactly right. Um, uh, I read it when grad school, and I should have been doing my thesis, okay? So, uh, and you know, and back then, you know, the internet was just connected with strings and cans, right? There wasn't anything else connected to the internet. And authors put their uh, email addresses in their books. So when I finished it over a weekend, I sent him a note to have, I love this book. And he, he answered me in like 15 minutes, right? I said, man, that's fantastic. So ever since then, uh, Clifford Stoll has been my hero. And it's been a fantastic book. Written in 1989. This is the guy, Clifford Stoll, was an astronomer at Berkeley Lab, and they were laying people off. So the IT department said, we really like Cliff, we don't want him to lose his job, so we're going to hire him over in the IT spot. And the head IT guy says, listen, Cliff, come over to us, run this Unix lab, right? Uh, and then when your job comes open in a couple of years, you can go back to being an astronomer. Right? Oh, and by the way, we have a 45 cent accounting error in our student bud our budget system. So you know, back then, students had to pay for computer time, okay? and it charged them on a monthly basis. And of all the students they had at Berkeley, there was this 45 cent balance error. He said, listen, uh, Cliff, you've solved that problem, you become a Unix expert, and you'll be valuable to us, and you can live here as long as you want. That 45 cent accounting error turned out to be the first documented cyber espionage case coming from hacker mercenaries out of East Germany, okay, being sponsored by the Russians. They were using academic institutions to break into government computers, right? That was a two-year investigation, okay, that he tracked down single-handedly and tracked down who those bad guys were, right? So what's interesting about this book is it still has things about it that we are still uh, uh, debating today. Stuff like how do you share information with the government, right? Uh, do we want privacy versus security if you're a Republican? Do you want liberty versus control if you're a Democrat? Okay, those kinds of discussions, right? Uh, cyber espionage, we're still facing that today. And the intelligence dilemma pops up again because Cliff is a lefty liberal from Berkeley, California. Okay? Look at him. He's kind, of a, he's kind of like the guy from Back to the Future, Doc, whatever his name is, right? He's that guy, right? He makes his own clothes. He makes his own food. He sews his own shoes. He has a garden out back. He, you know, he, he says he's not very political, but he doesn't like anybody on the right. And for, any, for the next two years, he's working closely with the FBI the NSA, and the CIA. And even back then, okay, they wanted information from him, but they didn't want to give him any information. Does that sound familiar? That's kind of the way it is uh, today. Okay. So uh, this is an excellent book. It reads like a cyber thriller. There's even a chocolate chip cookie recipe in the back. Uh, you need to go get it, and you should have read this one by now. Most of you have. That's good. All right. I got one last one. I'm going to go on. I know them over time, but I don't care. All right. This is my favorite novel of all time. How many people have read Cryptonomicon? All right, some real believers out there. That's great, okay? Written by Neil Stevenson. It's a fantastic book. It is the quintessential uh, idea of what cybersecurity is, is what we've become. It is the intersection between math and computer science that we've turned into computer security, right? Uh, it has these great characters as, this is a fictional book, but it has these real world characters. General Gehring is in there. That's a Lieutenant Ronald Reagan there on the left over there. Alan Turing, my personal computer science hero, and the, who they made the movie Imitation Game. Anybody seen the Imitation Game? Okay, you have to go see the Imitation Game. It is awesome, okay? It is awesome, All right? And that's uh, General Douglas MacArthur there over on the top right. So all those real world characters are interspersed in the book, okay? It is uh, a dual family story between World War II and dot-com of the 90s, so it kind of goes back and forth between the two families. It is a treasure hunt for gold. It kind of reads like an Indiana Jones adventure, right? Uh, but it has a gazillion ideas in it. If you've read any of Neil Stevenson's stuff, all his things have, are dense with ideas, and you're going to get a lot of them over here. You're not going to read this in a weekend, okay? You have to commit yourself to Cryptonomicon, because it's thick. It's about 1,000 pages, and it's a lot of stuff. But it's well worth your time. You should do it. All right, it talks about our history, it talks about tragedy and all the family, it talks about adventure, it's great. There's three geek love stories, okay? So 
I mean, you know, you get these crypto guys, and they're breaking Japanese codes and German codes, but you put them in a room with a girl, and they don't even know how to talk without drooling, okay? So it's that kind of thing, all right? And so this is my favorite novel of all time, and I, I advise you to go read it and read it as soon as you can. And you should have read it by now. All right, so uh, in order to get on the candidate list, you have to, we have to get a book review for it. I didn't want it to be just another list of books to read. They have to put some skin in the game. So in order to be on our candidate list, someone has to write a book review for it. All right, and up to this point, only the committee members have written book reviews, but that's not what we want. In this project, we want the community to write book reviews. So if you have a book that's not on this list that you feel passionate about, go to this website, and we'll send it to you later in the email, all right? And write it down and get the submission to us so we can put it on the candidate list for next year's awards. All right, and, la and from the month of February, we opened it up to internet voting. So everybody got a chance to choose, pick their best ones, and then the committee went and looked at those recommendations, and we chose four new books. They're gonna be inducted into the canon in our customer conference in April. I'm not gonna tell you which ones, because we're gonna announce that in April. But three of the four authors are coming to the conference. They're going to be on the panels. They're going to assign books, and it's going to be fantastic. So that's kind of fun. All right, so this last slide is from RSA. I'm preparing to give this presentation at RSA coming up. And they said I had to have a slide like this, so this is what you get, all right? So next week, you should go to my Canon website and read the book reviews for the books you are interested in. In the next three months, you should get a pile of lists that you think are not there and send them to me so I can start getting them reviewed by people who want to do that kind of thing. And in six months, please submit at least one review to the site. We think there should be about 150 books in the canon uh, before we get complete. So that's where we are. Uh, and that is my contact information, and thank you for listening to all that. Questions? Change this diaper. First, this is a, a, a great initiative. Um, so, one suggestion on uh, something to add, and one something uh, you're going to get. You're asking, you're oh, begging yeah. to get these. You bet. Um, the first is Blue Nowhere has to be removed. It, oh. it, it's callous. It talks about calluses. You can tell a hacker because of the thick calluses from typing on their fingers. Does anyone have thick calluses on their fingers? from typing. You're not a no. true hacker, Great. that's what it is. You, you don't type enough, that's what that is. Uh, the second would be uh, an addition. Uh, you should maybe think of a team category. That's uh, a great idea. Feed, uh, F33D, or uh, Little Brother, or both. Uh, uh, yeah. Little Brother is uh, in the queue to be put on there, so it's a good, that's a good, yeah, so great idea. And finally, a comment for the audience. Uh, when you think about dollar for dollar return on investment, one training course, I won't mention any providers, will cost $5,000, right, if you include travel. You could acquire the entire canon and give it to five of your soldiers for that same amount, and they'll get a year's worth of knowledge or more. Yeah. So we have to find ways that we can put books into people's hands, or Kindles. Or Kindles. Thanks, yeah. yes. Thank you, sir. Any others out there in the back? Anybody agree with me on the Jurassic Park idea? <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Chris May from Carnegie Mellon University, CERT team. Uh, you mentioned one of the books. Um, I teach a couple of classes at CMU, and uh, the Nowhere to Hide book by Glenn Greenwald is uh, not only controversial, uh, depending on what audience you happen to be in, um, forbidden in some cases to read. I just want to get your comment <laughs> Forbidden? On, really? Wow. Uh, well. I mean, there's some, there's some uh, documents published in that book that oh. if you have a secu security clearance, you may not want to actually review it. So I just want to get your kind of comments on, on uh, a books like Nowhere to Hide. Um, while potentially very, very valuable, um, it also can potentially pose, pose problems for some of the readers. Um, I think that's good. You should read stuff that you don't agree with, okay? So you can form your own ideas about that. And I will tell you, as part of my job as Palo Alto Networks CSO, I go around and I host these dinners for CISOs and CIOs and CTOs. We get about 15 of these guys in a room and a nice steak dinner, and we just have conversations. And I hold the Snowden question in check in case the conversation ever lags. 
So if it, if it starts to die out, I throw that grenade on the table and make everybody choose sides, all right? That's really fun to do, okay? Uh, but I did that in Houston, okay, one night, and I forgot where I was, all right? And I, I, would, and I was the only one choosing hero, all right? Everybody else was on the other side of that conversation, and they were all packing, okay? So that was not a smart thing to do. Uh, I know, but I absolutely think that we should have that conversation. You may not agree with the guy at everything he says, but read his book. It's pretty well written, right? And he makes valid points. You may not agree with them, but at least they're valid. This community has to debate those things. Because if we're not debating those things, nobody else is. Because we're the only ones that can understand the nuance, right? So, you may, so yes, I recommend, I'd say I don't care if they don't like the book. Go read that guy. Right? Good question. Any others? I think I'm done. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate that. Hey, yeah, you do. Mr. Howard, thank you for sharing with us the cybersecurity cannon. Here is your black badge. All right. I love it. Thank you, sir. Absolutely.